Okay, hello. Thank you. We're, uh, you know, that, um, and I'm glad to be here in person. Um, uh, are there any questions about the course or anything like that before I start talking to you about comments? Okay. So now, based on the introduction, I'm going to uh, explain in more detail uh, what the main question of the book actually is. So again, the main question of the book is, well, how are synthetic judgments possible? Um, so first of all, it's about judgments. I'm going to talk again about what judgments are this time. Um, and um, second of all, it refers to two dis different distinctions between different kinds of judgments. Um, Right, so the two distinctions are a priori versus a posteriori. And analytic versus synthetic. So in principle, there's four different possible combinations, but there's no analytic a posteriori, a posteriori, I really can't say that word. <laughs> there's no analytic a posteriori judgments, as I'll explain in a moment. So there's really only three different kinds. That is analytic, which are all a priori, and synthetic a, a posteriori, and synthetic a priori. Um, and the, the hard case is synthetic a priori. Um, <coughs> right, and so as I explained last time, uh, like roughly speaking, this distinction is a distinction between judgments that are based on experience and in judgments that are not based on experience. Um, so, um, so I'm not gonna say more about that for the moment, but I wanna try to get to, well, let me say one more thing about that. Um, a judgment, remember, as I said last time, is composed of concepts, right? So the simplest, this is called a categorical judgment. The simplest form of judgment says it's a universal affirmative uh, assertoric categorical judgment. <laughs> uh, this is the simplest kind. It says it has two uh, things it's talking about, the subject and the predicate. And the subject and the predicate are concepts, right? So the judgment is made of concepts. Um, and what I wanted to say um, is that, so of these two distinctions, this one is only a distinction between different types of judgments. So a judgment is either analytic or synthetic, whereas it doesn't make sense to ask whether a concept is analytic or synthetic. But this is uh, all is a distinction between types of judgments and a distinction between types of, between types of concepts. Because just as a judgment could be based on experience or not based on experience, a concept can be derived from experience or not derived from experience. Right? Uh, for those who are in 100 C, um, this is the thing I didn't get to talk about last time when Locke talking about innate principles and saying, well, we can't have innate principles unless we have innate ideas to make them up. 
uh, right? So innate, oh, even though, as I emphasized, a priori doesn't mean innate, but it's kind of like it. <laughs> right? And so, you know, it's the same idea. The judgment can be a priori or not. And if it's what Kant calls pure a priori, then the concepts in it also have to be a priori. All right. So, um, so are there questions about that before I go on? Okay, so now I want to try to explain what this distinction is. So, so this distinction is, um, at least in the case of a simple judgment like this, this distinction is a distinction between a, a, it has to do with the way the two concepts are related to each other. So, right, so that's why the judge, that's why it doesn't make sense to ask if the concept is analytic or synthetic. Analytic or synthetic has to do with how the concepts in the judgment are related to each other. Um, so what is a concept? Um, Well, first of all, a concept is the way uh, an understanding or intellect like our own. And remember, I said before that understanding and intellect are basically the same word. And it's in German for Stadt. These are both translations of the Latin word intellectus. Um, so, um, um, so intellect and understanding or intellect and verstand are the same thing. All right. So a concept is the way an intellect or understanding like ours represents something that is, has an object. Um, now, I mean, uh, I haven't said what is like important about ours compared to some other kinds. <laughs> um, uh, but I said something about that last time, but, um, but this is the way we intellectually represent things. Um, and a judgment is the way we represent something as so-and-so. Right, so this is why a judgment always has at least two concepts. The more complicated kinds have more concepts. But it always has at least two concepts in it because there has to be one that represents the object of the judgment. That is, the, the, what the judgment is about. And that, in, in this simple case, well, I, I mean, in this simple case, that's just the subject concept. And then it has at least one more concept in order to represent that thing as something. Um, and uh, more detail, what the concept does, according to Kant, is that uh, well, so I said last time the that if you express the judgment in language, you will get a sentence, right? The judgment is expressed by a sentence. I mean, um, uh, that is what I write on the board is always a sentence. Um, and typically the concept will be represented in, the, in that sentence by uh, a common noun or an adjective. So a concept is, um, in particular, it's it's a way of representing things universally or generally, the way a common noun does, or the way a concept does. Now, I mean, you might say, well, what about something like, what if, what if my judgment is Socrates is mortal? Famous judgment. 
um, and one that Plato is thinking about all the time. <laughs> anyway, um, so Socrates is mortal. You might say, well, this doesn't represent universally. This is a proper name. So there's, there's only one thing. So this is what's called a singular judgment. So I think the basic answer to that is that according to Kant, um, this judge, this kind of judgment always works by having this mean something like this human. Right? So that a singular judgment also always involves a subject concept. Um and, and this idea that the way our intellect represents things is by universals. So, and I say also, if you're in 100C, obviously this is pretty much the same thing that Locke means by abstract general idea. And the, 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 oh, the doctrine that the way our, rep, our intellect represents things is by universals is in, like an old Aristotelian doctrine. Right, that is that knowledge consists of universal truths. So um, our knowledge is to be put together out of judgments, and the judgments are going to contain universal concepts. Um, and so our knowledge, strictly speaking, is going to be in terms of universals. Um, okay. So, um, so now in more detail, there's two different ways of understanding what concepts and judgments are. And um, I introduce this every time I teach this course and people are never happy enough, but I'm gonna try to explain it better this time because, well, okay, I'm gonna erase this one. Because one way of looking at it is easier to understand and is the way that Kant usually talks about it. But it's not, a, it's oversimplified. <laughs> and the other way of thinking about it, I think, is the more accurate way of thinking about it, but it's harder to understand. So this is the easier way. So we think of a concept as um, consisting of a list of marks that its object has to have, that is, that something has to have to count as its object. And we can think of this list as the definition of the concept. Right? So, like, take the concept gold. And you might think that it equals like yellow, heavy, and um, soluble with aqua liquid. Right? Like, suppose that was the definition of gold. Now, I mean, this is already a way. That this is oversimplified because Kant actually says that the empirical concepts don't have definitions. That's that's later, like in the back of the book in the Doctrine of the Methods, but we're not getting into it. So, um, um, so but you can think of gold as being defined as yellow, heavy, and soluble in aqua regia, and what that would mean is that for something to count as gold, it has to be yellow and it has to be heavy and it has to be soluble in aqua regia. Um, um, and then you can think of the concept gold as just like the list of those characteristics that something has to be to count as gold. Um, And so then a judgment, at least a judgment of this form, S is P, the way you can understand it is that it has two lists, right? So um, like, let's say our judgment is gold is a metal. 
right? So this would be S and this would be P. And metal might be defined as like shiny, hard, conductor, electricity, whatever, some characteristics like this. Right. And so the judgment S is P, then we just say that whatever has the, the things in this list also has the things in this list. Right. So when we say gold is metal, we're saying that, that whatever has the things in the subject list has the things in the predicate list. I go on. All right, I'm going to say so just <clears throat> uh, in a preliminary way that so the dis in, in terms of this way of thinking about a judgment, the distinction between an analytic judgment and a synthetic judgment is that in analytic judgment, all the things on this predicate list are already in the subject list. Right? So, like if the judgment were, um, Instead of all gold is yellow, um, sorry, instead of all gold is a metal or is metallic, if the judgment were all gold is yellow. So yellow, so in this case, the predicate list just has one thing on it, yellow. <laughs> right, that is, I mean, that is, okay, I'm assuming that yellow is simple, actually, Unlike Locke, I don't think that Kant actually believes that our concepts can be divided into the simplest parts in general. Um, he doesn't talk about that. But imagine for the moment that yellow is somehow simple. So the definition of yellow is just yellow. <laughs> right? So there's just one thing on the list. Then this judgment, all gold is yellow, would attribute to the things that have these properties, <laughs> one of the properties that's already on the list. That would be an analytic judgment, right? So you could also say it's true by definition. Now, I mean, again, it, it can be misleading even within this simpler kind of picture to, to think that, to think true by definition because Kant doesn't think that we necessarily have a definition of all our concepts. And moreover, as I said, he thinks that empirical concepts can't actually be defined. <laughs> so, um, uh, but still, uh, like the easy way to understand what an analytic judgment is, is that it's a judgment that's true by definition because all the things in the predicate are part of the definition of the subject. And you can see why, at least vaguely, you can see why that would have to, why you would think that that couldn't be a posteriori, right? It couldn't be based on experience. Now, when I, when I say it's not innate, right? Like all gold is yellow is not innate. It couldn't be unless we knew what gold was when we were born. Right, and presumably we don't. So, like that's one of Locke's arguments against innate principles. He says, like babies aren't born knowing, having all these what he calls ideas or what we call concepts. Babies aren't born with them, so they can't be born knowing things like this. But that's why I say a priori is not the same thing as innate. A priori means like it's true. You couldn't make this judgment into a certain point. But when you do make this judgment, it's not based on experience. It's just based on knowing the definition. Don't, so to speak, have to wait and see or like go out and check whether all gold is yellow if you put it in the definition of gold. Um, all 
<laughs> okay. I mean, this is not, since these concepts are not a priori, this is not a pure a priori judgment. But it is it is an a priori judgment. It's not based on experience. All right. So that's the easy way of thinking about it. Now, um, so the hard way to think about it is that a concept is a rule. The concept is a rule, and this is how. Um, um, so this is how an intellect or understanding, an active faculty of knowledge in general represents things. It has its own rule, and the object must conform to the rule. That's. Um, that's why it's called active. If you were in 100B, you, you you may remember that towards the end, that's basically like how Spinoza and Leibniz, in, in Leibniz, that's the definition of activity. Having a rule that's something that, you know, clearly and distinctly that something else must conform to. According to Leibniz, is the only way of acting on anything. Right, so... Um, uh, so this is why, like, when we ask, how does our intellect represent things? How does our understanding represent things? The answer is going to be some kind of rule of our own that we set up. Uh, um, and what makes us the kind of understanding we are is that um, our rule is always something that numerous possible objects might conform to. Again, if that is our concepts are universal. Uh, okay, so a concept is some kind of rule. Now, I mean, so like this easy way of thinking things is a special case of a hard way, right? Like this is a rule. Or that is, you can easily transform it into a rule. The rule is you have to be yellow, heavy, and soluble in aqua regia. <laughs> right? That's the rule we're setting up. But um, but uh, the rule that constitutes a concept may not be so easy to state as that. It may not just be a list of things. I mean, like, for example, um, Suppose the concept of metal is not just a list of things like this, but suppose that this is actually not true. I looked this up, but suppose there's like um, suppose there's like a relationship between melting point and conductivity. that constitutes, it's part of being a, a metal. And we build that into our concept. So it's going to be like, you know, metals fall on this curve, right? So that's like a rule, but it's not a single property that all metals have in common. It's a rule they all conform to, right? So, um, so uh, you know, and when you get to these, uh, <laughs> um, concepts like cause and whatever, it may be really hard to think of a list of characteristics, um, but it's easy to think of them as a rule that things have to conform to. Okay, so that's what a concept is. And then a judgment um, is um, The judgment applies a rule on a condition. So in the case of this simple kind of judgment, right? Like 
gold is metallic. The condition is the subject rule, right? That is, um, I'm representing things as metallic on the condition that they're gold. I'm not representing everything as metallic. <laughs> I'm representing everything is metallic on the condition that it's gold. Um, and um, I think this is the way Kant talks about judgments when he's being more abstract and careful and therefore harder to understand, but I think also more accurate. Um, because like, so take a judgment like, So this is what's called a hypothetical judgment, right? This, as I said, is a categorical judgment. This is a hypothetical judgment. Um, according to Kant, there's three different relations of judgment. I won't talk about the third one yet, but just look at this hypothetical one. So in this case, so this is the rule that the judgment is applying. It's applying it to something. The subject of the judgment, but the condition it's applying it on is not something about the subject, but is this other thing. At least I think that's the right way to think about a hypothetical judgment. I, you know, so okay, this is this is kind of a almost a running joke in this book. It happens so much that um, there'll be like three different cases or four different cases of something. And Kant will explain the first case. And then he'll say, and the other cases are easy to fill in. And when you start thinking about the other cases, you realize that they're much harder than the first case. <laughs> right? And it's really not clear how he means for you to fill them in. Um, and he does this over and over. And so, for example, he usually talks about categorical judgment. It just leads you to figure out how it's supposed to apply to the other types of um, So, um, um, but so, but I think this is the right way to think about it. That every judgment has a subject, and in the case of a hypothetical judgment, it's this. And every judgment has a condition, <laughs> but in the condition case of a hypothetical judgment, the condition is external to the subject. Even if we had C here again, this would still be external to the subject in the sense that, um, um, unless this is analytic, <laughs> that is, unless this is analytic, um, this is going to be something about gold that's not part of my definition of gold. Right? So, but the general form is like this. I mean, I, I'm mentioning that special case because, again, Kant often uh, will give examples of that special case, and then you have to figure out what to do when the subjects are different. <laughs> um, but actually, his main example of a hypothetical judgment is um, uh, if there is perfect justice, then the obstinately wicked will be punished. Right. So the subject here, I guess the subject here is like the world, right? There is perfect justice, means like if the world is perfectly just. Um, if there is perfect justice, then the obstinately wicked will be punished. So that um, the condition, if there is perfect justice, doesn't have anything to do directly with the subject, the obstinately wicked. Um, Right. The, the third kind that's called a disjunctive judgment is the hardest one to understand. Um, either A is B. 
or C is D or and you can have more clauses like this. And this is exclusive or as we all say, right? So meaning that exactly one of these has to be true. Um, here, what's the subject? <laughs> Um, I kind of, you know, and well, actually, let me let me not get involved in that. But it's going to come back to finance, all right? Um, so on this way of thinking about it, right? So on this way of thinking about it, an analytic judgment is a judgment where the things on the predicate list are are already on the subject list. In this way of thinking about it, an analytic judgment is a judgment where the condition by itself is already enough to tell the rule applies. So um, as opposed to a synthetic judgment, right? So in this case, a synthetic judgment, and at least on this way of defining gold, Right, like of course, if I define gold as a yellow heavy metal, <laughs> then all gold is metal would be analytic. Right. So, um, but now having left metal off of this list, that means that uh, the judgment all gold is metal is synthetic. Um, and this way of understanding it, it means that um, the condition doesn't by itself explain why that rule should apply. I guess I should say also about this as opposed to this. Um, you know, and not only was dealing with the categorical judgment, but with uh, universal categorical judgment. So, I often don't write this all um, when I write universal judgments because um, I think the it's important for understanding what conflicts universal judgments are that, um, and how universality is related to the category of unity. But the universal judgment basically means taking this subject concept to refer to one thing. It's all the same. So get rid of the lost all, right? But so that's a universal judgment, but here's a particular judgment, sum S is P. Right, like, uh, am I still on the screen? Yes. Some, some cinnabar is shiny. Cinnabar is like, uh, for whatever reason, it's the example I love to use in this course. It's mercury sulfide. It's like a it Kant, I mean, Kant uses an example somewhere or another. <laughs> uh, it's like a heavy red um, toxic because it contains mercury mineral. Um, and this this is true. It does it has different different types of cinnabar and different luster, right? Some of them are shiny and some are not, or whatever, right? So uh some cinnabar is, is shiny. So like in this way of understanding it, you um, you already run into trouble. So on this way of understanding it, you've gone from using this as the condition to using this plus some unspecified way of partitioning it as the condition. Right, so if I find a piece of cinnabar that's not shiny, you know, um, this judgment will say to me, well, you haven't met the condition, you didn't find the right part. <laughs> um, oh, 
Okay. Um, Uh, as another example of what I was talking about, it's easy to think of analytic judgments that are universal, categorical, affirmative, right? Affirmative as opposed to negative. So like a negative judgment in this. Uh, I think a negative judgment is supposed to be all gold is not yellow. Supposed to be not all <laughs> gold. Anyway, um, uh, but so it's easy to think of, an, of, a, of analytic judgments. Well, so on this way of thinking about it, we're we're always going to be looking for analytic judgments that are like this, right? Because we're just checking these lists against each other. On this way of thinking about it, we should have a way. We should be able to give examples of analytic judgments that are particular or hypothetical. Or how doesn't give any examples like that? Um, and it's not easy to think of them. Um, but I mean, like I think in this case, for example, we probably think that this is an analytic judgment. Um, All gold is yellow. Or let me not let me not confuse it by looking at one's inside anyway. If all gold is a metal, then some gold is a metal. But if this is an example in the Aristotelian logic of what's called an immediate conclusion or conversion where you go from the universal judgment to the particular judgment. Now, like in our kind of post Phrygian logic that you learn in Bill 9, you, you wouldn't say this, right? Because you would say, this could be true even though there's no goal. <laughs> and then this would be false. But that's not the way Aristotelians think about universal judgments. So, Oh, right. So I think Kant would say that this is a uh, analytic judgment. Um, and it appears that negative judgments are analytic when um, um, when the subject contradicts the predicate. Right, so like if this list had not yellow on it, then the, the uh, negative judgment would be analytic. Okay. Um, okay, so, but getting back to synthetic judgment. So it, like in this case, the synthetic judgment, you could say, well, uh, somehow or other, I have to attach the things on this list to the things on this list. It's not very clear what that problem is. I think on this way of uh, thinking about it, it's easier to understand. The question is, um, the, the condition doesn't provide any basis for claiming that that rule applies in that condition. So there must be something else, <laughs> right? This is what Kant calls the third thing equals X. There must be something else that I'm bringing in um, that, is, that, that, that is the basis for my asserting that the rule applies in that condition. So a synthetic judgment um, always requires that third thing. Something outside the condition of the judgment.
Okay. Is 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 that all clear so far? Yes. Um, I'm having trouble understanding the if A is B then C must be the same. How A and B can be kind of in any way unrelated to C. Like in the example that you gave of if there's perfect justice, then perfect justice is punished. You yeah, also can't true. help but thinking about that. Like perfect justice is the subject. The perfect justice. Oh, you mean that 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 it's. Yeah, I mean, you could think that the the antecedent is if perfect justice exists, and then perfect justice is the subject. I was trying to avoid that, but but you're saying, but it's not the subject of the consequence, right? It's not perfect justice will be punished. Right, but I don't. I don't understand how. Um, I don't understand how there could be a clause in which the first part is like not directly related to the second part. Because perfect justice, in my mind, the definition of that is in which the wicked will be punished. Yeah, the opposite of evil, right? He's he's trying to leave room for repentance. Um, but yeah. Uh, um, well. I mean, of course, yes, there has to be, if it's true, there has to be some relationship between the two, right? Um, uh, uh, you're, what you're saying is that maybe that itself is an example of an analytic hypothetical judgment, right? That it's like part of the definition of perfect justice, that the opposite of the wicked will be punished. Maybe, yeah, maybe Kantik is that. Um, but that still does that. So um, that still doesn't make the two clauses have the same subject or the same credit. They're, they're different. So I mean, you're saying that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if Kant thinks that's analytic or synthetic. So it's unfortunate. That's and Kant often does this. I mean, it's partly it's kind of traditional, like Wolf and Kant's other predecessors often use examples like this. But these like moral examples, they, they're not so that concepts are not empirical. And like it's you know, um uh I wish he gave examples like this. <laughs> But I mean, there there may be good reasons why he doesn't, besides just tradition. He may be thinking, well, like I said, he may be thinking that empirical concepts don't have definitions. And so you wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> so um, um but yeah, so so anyway, the question of whether that's analytic or synthetic would be like that's a question that you'd have to go to Kant's moral philosophy and try to figure out. You know, it, it, like a lot of it is analytic, and then at some point, some point, something synthetic comes in. But, um, but, but still, you see, like I said, it doesn't. There's still two different clauses with a di different subjects with different predicates. It's just the question is, is the you know, can you see logically why? One has to follow the other, or do you need something else? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and it's it's hard to think of examples, synthetic examples with empirical concepts where the subjects are different. I've never thought of a good example. <laughs> yeah. If you write off the example like this as like if there is an act. That is that act is full, then that act is a talent. Or would it be like um if there is an act that exists and that act is full, that act is a talent. So or like it is, but like it is is there something you know? Yeah, so I mean
the re okay, I should I should try to explain why I'm so hung up about trying to answer this question. I mean, so like you know. So like this is the closest thing that we write in the in the symbolism that you learn in film nine, right? Like for all x, if x is gold, then x is metallic, right? And like and there's different ways of understanding this quantification, but the kind of Kleinian way that we mostly understand it now is that. Um, It's, you start with a sentence like this with a free variable, and the free variable can mean anything in the domain. And then, like, so, like, you, you, those are all the permissible interpretations of the sentence, right? And then, like, based on that, then you build up, like, what's, what are going to be permissible interpretations of this sentence? And is it true under all interpretations? You know, et cetera. So, I mean, like, even like, that's not the way Frege thought about universal quantification, right? He thought of it basically, he thought of this X as like a placeholder, right? Like the, like the, like the variable in an integer, where you just need something to like, to tie those two things together, right? So he thought of this as really like a relationship between these two concepts. Um, but, uh, you know, of course it does, but whatever way of thinking about it, it should still follow that if I have something, if it's gold, then that very thing is metal. So it's not like a mistake to think about it that way, but, um, uh, but it's already blurring the distinction between thinking about our concepts and how they're related to each other and thinking about how they're able to refer to an object. And that's going to be like a key distinction in the whole book. So, um, right. So, but all of that, like, I don't think you intended to raise, to raise all of that just by asking it. I mean, you know, it just means if this is true, then this is true. So like if you were asking like where do the quantifiers go or something like that, it, you know, these are supposed to be two separate judgments. Um, Todd says that, that, that the, the judgments within the hypothetical judgment are not asserted, but they're, they have a um, problematic force that is I'm taking them as possibly true. And then I just relate them this way. Did, I don't know. Did that? Did all of that jumble together in your question? Or you, okay. All right. Um, I mean, it's like what I was just saying is is super complicated because it's not like our logic and Kant's logic, which is at least his understanding of Aristotelian logic, right? That is. He says, logic, strictly speaking, formal or general logic, hasn't advanced a step since Aristotle. So uh, um, uh, it's not like our logic and that logic. On the one hand, they're not exactly just two versions of the same thing. <laughs> it's, but on the other hand, it's not like there's no historical relationship between them either. So, um, um, and it's not, a coincidence that people like Klein, you know, using this new logic are still asking about whether you can determine if a sentence is analytic or synthetic. Um, okay, but all right. Hopefully that's enough about all of that for now. What was I talking about before that started? Uh, oh, I was just asking for more questions. Are there more questions? Those were good questions. Okay, so um, uh, 
Okay, so that's that's the analytic synthetic distinction. Now, I, I mean, as I said, I already kind of like, you know, gave a spoiler to this in terms of analytic judgments, but now I want to go back and say and talk about how the analytic synthetic distinction is related to the a priori, a posteriori distinction. Um, maybe I'll leave that one up. Um, okay, so again, the a priori versus a posteriori. This means like from before or from the earlier, the wrong ablative ending, but you know, anyway. Uh -oh. uh, and this means from after. So, um, um, the metaphor is, and like from before what, or what from earlier, compared to what, right? And the answer is from before experience versus from after experience. Um, but, and now in this, in the reading for today, you saw Kant actually saying this, uh, that before and after is a metaphor. It's not literal. Right, as Kant says on the um, first page of the introduction, so it's B1, right? That is, it's page one in the B edition. Um, So it's on, it's on page 41 of the translation. In the order of time, therefore, we have no knowledge antecedent to experience. And with experience, all our knowledge begins, right? So there is no time before experience when we do things a priori. Um, and uh, um, There, I mean, I keep emphasizing this because um, Kant is going to keep talking as if there were such a time, <laughs> right? That is, he's going to, I mean, he's not going to oftentimes, you know, or maybe ever like talk about a time, but he's going to talk about a priori faculties doing things. Like, like a priori the a priori understanding, making a priori judgments in terms of a priori concepts. And this would this would all have to be stuff that would be done in that non-existent time, right? It's really a metaphor for something else. Um, I guess I'm not ready to say exactly what it's a metaphor for yet. Um, But, um, yeah, I think I'm going to talk about that, start talking about that next time we start reading the aesthetic. But, um, so what So what this means, so when we say it's a priori, like it means it doesn't arise from experience. It's not based on experience. It's not derived from experience. Um, and uh, this means it is derived from experience. So and these are the examples I talked about last time. I write them up again now. Like so, an example of an a posteriori judgment is all bodies are heavy. And as I said, this is really the law of universal gravitation, and it's. Um, most of the examples of synthetic judgments in the book are somehow variations of this. 
They're not built like he mentions in the introduction, buildings falling down, right? The, the ships going down the stream example, it's gonna, gonna come later. Not all of them are. There's some, like there's one about a room being heated, but um, th this is like, this is the important a posteriori judgment because it's the a posteriori judgment of Newton's physics, right? That's, um, uh, so as opposed to examples of a priori judgments, like there is a unique straight line between two points. Or, and like most of the geometrical examples in the book are somehow related to this, right? Like the one he discusses in the introduction is about the, that the, the straight line between two points is the shortest path. Um, okay, and uh, another example is every event has a cause. Um, are you not able to see these because of I moved this. Oh, okay, well, just remember that I run every task. <laughs> I'll try to write things higher up on this side of the board. All right, so... Um, um, Okay, so um, actually, I'm going to come back to analytic judgments after I say something about synthetic uh, posteriori. I can't say post posteriori. I don't know why. Synthetic a posteriori judgments. Um, so, like, so first of all, you could ask, um, how are synthetic a posteriori judgments possible? Right. By the way, these, so these are both synthetic. These are synthetic a priori judgments. This is a synthetic a posteriori judgment. So you could ask, how are synthetic a posteriori judgments possible? I mean, this is kind of like what you were asking about the hypothetical judgments. Like, how can a judgment be synthetic at all? Um, so Kant takes it as like, given that, you know, of course, everyone agrees that these are possible in, in, in this discussion. And it's because he's arguing against empiricists here, right? So like empiricists definitely agree that judgments like this are possible. Um, but uh, rationalists don't agree that judgments like that are possible. Um, so, uh, you know, what Leibniz would say about this judgment, and what Leibniz did say about this judgment, is that um, this concept picks out the object of the judgment. So the judgment is about exactly what conforms to this concept. So if I claim something here that's not part of this concept, I'm talking about something else. <laughs> right? That is, I'm not talking about what I was thinking about. What I was thinking about is bought, and now I'm bringing in something else. So I've just changed the subject. I mean, um, I 
This is why This is why something like gravitation is is the Leibniz would call it a, an occult property, right? It's a property that supposedly belongs to whatever is the object of this concept, but um, the concept doesn't require it. Um, so it's just totally mysterious. It's, um, I'm somehow saying that the thing I'm thinking about is not the thing I'm thinking about, but some other thing. Um, and so Leibniz says this has to be false, right? Like, so that is when Leibniz argues with Clark, who's writing on behalf of Newton, um, Leibniz says, you know, uh, uh, this power that you're attributing to bodies is, is just a power that bodies can't have. Bodies can only have the powers that follow from the definition of body. They can move each other by pushing. But this other thing, so Leibniz says this would be a miracle of the highest kind. That is, this, this you know, God could make bodies move this way, but only by by doing, the effect could be something that's completely beyond the power of any creature. And then he says, and we shouldn't have built in miracles in natural science. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, so therefore he says, this is false. This is not a good law of nature. So Kant wants to explain First of all, Kant has an explanation for why synthetic a posteriori genetics are possible, right? So the explanation is, so obviously the, the, the third thing, if this is the condition, and this is the rule, and there's gonna be a third thing in here that connects them. The third thing is experience. But how does that work exactly? Um, how do we know more about what fulfills this condition that is contained in the condition? So the answer is that the thing that meets the condition affects us. Leibniz thinks that's impossible. <laughs> um, the thing that meets the condition, right? So if if this is all gold is metal, the thing that meets the condition is gold. Gold is the object of my concept. Can't see even over there. Okay, I'm sorry. Did I? Oh. <laughs> Um, gold is the object of my concept, meaning it's the thing that meets the, con the, the condition of, right? So this is the rule of the judgment, but this concept also is a rule, right? And its object is the thing that conforms to its rule. So the thing that conforms to its rule is gold. And that thing, gold, has effects on me. It affects my sense organs. Um, and so I know that gold is metal or is a metal, at least I know it always has been so far, right? And Kant says these a posteriori judgments are never absolutely universal. And right, and this is this is like a beginning of understanding why they're never absolutely universal, because what I know is that so far everything that met this condition also affected me in a certain way.
So they, there's like one whole thing out here, but it's doing two things at the same time. That is, it's conforming to this rule, thereby enabling it to be referred to by this concept. But it's also affecting me in some regular way that does that doesn't have to do with conforming to this rule. So I look, Kant says, I look back through the things that have fallen under this concept. Right? He says that in the case of this judgment, all bodies are heavy. I look back over all the things that met my definition of body, all the extended substances I've encountered, and I find that they all affected me in this other way, the way something heavy would affect me. Right? And then if I form or perhaps if I don't already have a concept that something can conform to precisely by affecting me in that way, the way of being heavy, that's the concept heavy, right? And I say, oh, this same thing that conformed to this concept, and therefore, therefore I was able to refer to it with this concept, also always conform to this concept. And I conclude that this one thing is, that it is gold is also heavy. Right, that's like another way to see why you should write it, why need not write the all necessarily. The point is like the this this same whole thing, goal, I've learned from experience is also heaven. Um So why can why can this never be absolutely universal? And why do we never see another thing that Kant says about a posteriori judgments? They never claim absolute necessity. Right? That is, I judge that gold happens to be metal, but I can't see that it must be. So um, you might think something like, well, th because there is no rule from which all our experience follows, right? So like, we, you know, it's just, uh, um, at least as far as we know, there's no rule. This is basically what Hume thinks. As far as we know, there's no rule at all to how things succeed our, each other in our experience, what things come together and what things come separate. So just because these things have come together until now, it doesn't give us any reason for thinking that they'll come together in the future, right? Those are just two different uh, events and we don't see any connection between them. But um, according to Kant, the reason is there is a rule. There's a rule according to which all our experience of gold unfolds. But the rule isn't in us, the rule is in gold. Right? So our intellectual faculty, the faculty by which we form our own rules and try to find things that conform to um, is not sufficient. Um, our, that our concept gold is not sufficient to figure out what gold is going to do in the future. We only know that it will continue to be yellow, heavy, and soluble in aqua regia because that we built that into our rule, right? So if it's not that, it's not gold. But we can't derive from that any other things that gold is going to do to us. But there is a rule according to which gold does things to us, and the rule is in gold. Right. 
So we don't have it, but we know it's there. So we can try to find out what it is. Right, so we can like collect evidence. So far, all the gold has been metal. Looking like this rule might make gold metal. metal. Are we sure that it always has to be yellow? No. I mean, uh, like, if someone were able to solve the so-called problem of induction that way, that would be bad because we're not sure. <laughs> Right. So, um, like, but are we sure that there's a right answer? Yeah, and that we're we're doing the right thing to try to find it. Yes. Um, we just can never be sure that we have found it because, um, uh. Ultimately, and this is what makes this an object of experience, our ultimate relation to it is by it affecting, it affecting us according to its rule. That is, its immediate relation to us is through a passive faculty, a passive power, the power of sense. The power of sense is not an intellectual active faculty. We don't uh, it doesn't set up rules that the, its objects have to conform to. It waits for its objects to affect it according to their rules, right? So it's like almost as if the goal were representing us. <laughs> according to Leibniz, that is what's going on. Right? According to Leibniz, the other the objects uh, that I'm dealing with are always also representing me, <laughs> but not according to Kant. But it's as if, right? Like it's as if the goal has a concept of me, according to which it's affecting me. <laughs> um, okay, so first of all, so I've explained how the synthetic a posteriori judgment is possible up to a point, right? That is, I've explained, um, first of all, like, how we can so much as claim that gold does anything other than be gold, <laughs> right? We can, the, the reason is because once I pick out something using this concept, I can then wait and see how that thing affects me. Right, so Kant, can I write two more Yeah. So this is on B12. While the one concept is not contained in the other, they yet belong to one another, though only contingently as parts of a whole, namely of an experience which is itself a synthetic combination of intuitions. Right, that's what I'm saying. There's the two concepts, in this case metal, right? Because this, this way it affects me is conforms to my concept metal. So the two concepts, gold and metal, belong to each other as parts of this whole. It's kind of a metaphorical way of, right? It's not like this is actually composed of concepts. It's, it's gold, right? But it's as parts of my, my experience of this one thing. It, one part of it is it's that it conforms to this rule, and another part of it is conforms to this rule. Um, so I've explained how it's possible to so much as claim that, and also why it's rational to think that, right? As long as you're not completely sure, right? Like, don't go thinking that you're sure that gold will never do something else. Um, but, uh, but it's rational to think, you know, as far as we know, gold is a metal. Um, because we know that there's some rule. Okay, but how do we know that? That, right, that is, how do we know that there's some?
this is the point where Hume says we don't. <laughs> if we do know that, and this principle, every event has a cause, is basically a form of saying that we know that. <laughs> right? If we do know that, we couldn't have learned that from experience. Right? We couldn't learn from experience that the objects of our experience have rules in them that we don't know and we have to find out about. So that has to be synthetic a priori. But now, like maybe I should call this thing experience. Maybe, but this is what connects the two concepts. The picture is gonna be, to draw the picture a different way, but, <laughs> um, um, right? So it's it's this one whole experience of the thing that's that's, picked out as the object of this concept, to which I'm then gonna apply this other concept. And I'm licensed by the way that one thing affected me. That's how the synthetic a posteriori judgment works. But now we're seeing that synthetic a posteriori judgments are, um, are really no good unless we also have this op synthetic a priori judgment. No good, I mean, we can, we can still, we will still, as Hume says, go around believing. <laughs> um, but we can't explain why we should. Um, unless we also have this synthetic a priori judgment, and yet, you can see how hard it is can it, it's going to be to explain how we can have a synthetic operating judgment. Because without this, what's the third thing? Right? Like, what's going to connect the two concepts? With each other? So now I just have two rules that are my rules. Um, and that's all I know about them, right? So that's why Kant, Kant often describes metaphysics as philosophical no knowledge from concepts alone. All I know about them is that, you know, I have this rule and I have that. What's going to tell me that something that conforms to one of them has to conform to the other one? Well, of course, we understand if one of them is an implication of the other one. Right? That is, if if one of them is sufficient by itself without knowing anything about the object to, to see why this one has to hold. And that's an analytic judgment. Right? So, and, and now you can see, I think, better why all analytic judgments are a priori. Yeah, like, by the way, uh, nowadays, some people think that some analytic judgments are a posteriori. Right, like Saul Kripke is famous for having produced what's supposed to be an example of this. Uh, it's not clear that he's even talking about the same thing. <laughs> right, so I, I'm not going to get into that. But you can see why, from Kant's point of view, all analytic judgments are a priori, because if it's if it's a priori, if it's analytic, there's nothing for experience to do. We don't need a third thing to connect the two concepts. So it doesn't make sense to say that experience is the third thing, because there's, there's no call for a third thing to begin with. Um, and I think that's better than that view of the, the lists, right? Because it, you might say something like, well, I don't have to know anything about objects. I just have to check my lists. But it's checking your list sounds like it might be kind of experience. Check one thing after another, or whatever. <laughs> the, the point is, like, if this is my condition and this is my, and my condition implies my rule, then I already, like, know, I have to know that if I understand my condition. Um, and there's no room for something else to come in and help. 
So the analytic judgments are all a priori, um, but uh, but the analytic judgments a priori are not going to get us right. They're not going to get us this kind of result that we need. Right, an event you can define an event. It's like a change in state of the world or something like that. It changes from one state to another state. Um, you can define, sort of define a cause. Anyway, I mean, um, you compare it to this principle. Every effect has a promise. This is analytic. Right? Every effect has a cause. Well, of course, if it didn't have a cause, it wouldn't be an effect. But how do we know that every event is an effect? Saying that the world changed from one state to another doesn't say anything about its relationship to anything else. Um, so this is synthetic. It better be a priori or else we can't know it at all. And uh, yet it's really hard to understand what we're going to put in there to connect them. And most, well, about half of the book is going to be about trying to explain how that works. Right, what I was calling the positive part of the project last time is all about explaining how that works. About another half of the book. I mean, not exactly, there's some other parts and whatever, but about another half of the book is going to be about. Um, the cases where we think we can do that, but we really can't, and explaining why we think we can do that, and what mistake we made, and so forth. Um, um, I wrote this down in my notes from last year that this lecture actually came in short, which is very unusual for me. Uh, it seems to happen again. Let's see. Uh, I guess, well, I'll say one more thing about this. So, um, um, so this question, how are the synthetic, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? Um, but, thinks that the empiricists um, saw that this was a good question, but uh, they were unable to come up with an answer. That is, they weren't able to come up with a good answer. So Locke does have an answer, um, but Kant agrees with Hume that it's no good. Um, so, uh, so that's so that's the criticism of the empiricists. The criticism of the empiricists is they understood that this was a difficult question, but they were not able to solve it. And so, with Hume, they left uh, philosophy in a state of skepticism, right? Like we need to know this if we're going to know anything about the world, but we can't know it. Um, but the criticism of the rationalists and. Again, in a way, the criticism of the rationalists is worse than the criticism of the empiricists, right? Like, even though in some ways Kant is closer to the rationalists, I, I think actually, if you if you look more carefully, you'll see that he's more critical of them, more critical of Leibniz than he ever thought, uh, let alone him. So um, the criticism of the, of the rationalists is they didn't even understand that this was a question. But they didn't sufficiently focus on the difference between the analytic and the synthetic judgment. So they somehow confusedly thought, because remember, like they basically say that all judgments are analytic. 
but they somehow confusedly thought that you could you could increase your knowledge through those analytic judgments. So they were really talking about synthetic a priori judgments, but they didn't see that there was any question about how to. Now, like whether that's a fair criticism of the rationalists is a good question. But um, I think that's the way, that's what Kant thinks before. Okay, so that is all I have to say for today, and I will see you on Wednesday.